Hello, it's now September 2021, and over the summer, I've been working through a number of issues and improvements to the software for the DIY BMS. I still find it amazing that this little project kicked off in November 2017, nearly four years ago now, and has grown significantly in the number of people using it and also in the features it supports. I set myself a challenge for 2021 to grow my YouTube channel, and so far I've doubled the number of subscribers and I've also released a lot more videos. However, I know at least 40% of you have not subscribed according to the analytics. So please consider clicking that subscribe button now. Let me give you a recap of what I've been doing over the summer. First of all, there are no hardware changes, which I'm sure you'll be glad about. So if you're using the new style controller, everything I'm about to show you can be obtained by upgrading the controller software. There are no upgrades or software changes to the old style controller. If we look at the controller web interface and the settings page, you can see the number of series modules has been increased to a maximum of 128. I've added this in as it was a very simple change and a few users have requested it. However, I really recommend sticking to a maximum of 48 voltage batteries, really for safety, particularly if you're building them yourself. Once you start going above 50 volts DC, there is a genuine risk of an electrical arc and that won't end well. I've also been given reports that the controller does start to struggle when there are a lot of modules connected and failures in communication can occur when the round trip time increases to, to several seconds. If we jump over to the integration page, I fixed an issue with the Influx API. This fixes a problem where only the first bank was reported to the Influx database. And whilst I had the covers off, I also took the opportunity to upgrade Influx to use the newer version two API. A little later in this video, I'll show you how easy it is to use Influx Deep Database uh, and to set that up using Docker. I've also solved a problem where the controller ran out of memory if both MQTT and Influx were enabled in some configurations. I've also fixed a, another MQTT issue where it didn't correctly report cell number eight for some reason. I've also added in um, an extra parameter for the current monitoring data provided by the DIY BMS shunt. On screen, a cosmetic change has been made to show the number of active rules and a little bubble in the menu bar. This makes it easy to see if there's any rules active from any particular page. On the storage page, there's now a new option to save the configuration of the whole controller to a file on the SD card. At the moment, this just saves a file with the settings in it. And in the future, we'll look to import these settings automatically after an upgrade is made to the controller. If you didn't already know, you can also save the Wi-Fi settings to the SD card. This allows the controller to automatically reconnect to Wi-Fi when the firmware is upgraded, which sometimes wipes out these settings. Both of these files may contain unencrypted usernames and passwords, so perhaps delete them from the SD card once you've made a secure backup. I've recently introduced a change to the code on the modules, which introduces a feature called oversampling. On the support forum, a few people were asking about the voltage read readings they were seeing during charging. They would often appear to bounce between two values. The modules use the built-in analog to digital, digital converter, the ADC, of the AtTiny chip. Due to the way ADCs work, they convert analog voltages into a series of steps or levels. The AtTiny uses a 10-bit ADC, which gives 1,024 different steps. You can often get fluctuations in the voltage readings when the voltage is near the edge of one of these steps. The graph on screen was submitted onto the forum. It shows the before and after effect of the new code. On the left is the original code, and notice the bounce up and down. And on the right is after this the code, where the swing in voltage readings is much more consistent and sits in the middle, or the average, of the previous readings. These bounces are very small though, just a single step of the ADC, which is 0.004 volts. This is another example from the forum um, taken from InfluxDB. On the left, you can see the voltages whilst the battery was discharging at 2.5 kilowatts. And on the right is the same load with a new code, which removes a lot of the noise from the graph and the readings. The new code does something called oversampling, which is a tried and trusted technique used to improve the resolution of analog to digital converters. The module uses five times oversampling there's a good reference document from Analog which describes the process in fine detail. For the technical minded people out there, I'll put a link to this in the description. The downside of this new code is that it takes fractionally longer to process these extra samples. So the replies from the modules take a few milliseconds more. 
This new code works on all hardware revisions of the modules and is on GitHub now. So the other big change I've made is to introduce a state of charge calculation when you're using the DIY BMS current monitor and the controller. After the last video, I was asked a few times for a wiring diagram on how to connect the controller and shunt together. This is one of my DIY BMS test systems. I have a few of these to try out different code and ideas. It's basically a very small power wall on a sheet of plywood. This one is using Sanyo 16 650 cells. There are six in parallel and three in series. I've soldered these cells together in this, into this pack, which I don't recommend for large battery systems. You're better off there using welding and nickel strips instead. I'm going to put some insulating material over the top of this battery, so I don't accidentally uh, touch it whilst recording this video, although sparks and explosions generally increase the likes. These cells were taken out of uh, laptop batteries a few years ago and have been sitting on my shelf for some time. They still appear to work well and can be charged to quite a high voltage of 4.35 volts. When new, they had a capacity of around 2,300 milliamp hours. On the right, you can see the uh, three mon monitoring modules connected to them. And the top two have external cell temperature probes attached to the cells. Uh, I've got a mix of module types here, 4.4 and 4.21 versions. Connecting the shunt to the controller is very simple. The four pin connector is connected from the controller to the shunt. Each wire goes to the same terminal on the other end. So pin one goes to pin one, two goes to two, and so on. I'll use some leftover ethernet cable to connect mine up. The current shunt is connected directly to the battery positive on the right hand terminal. In a larger system, you would normally have a fuse connected to the battery before the shunt. There's also this extra cable, which provides the voltage sensing, and that goes directly to the battery as well. On the left side of the shunt, all the generators and consumers of energy are connected. Anything connected on this side of the shunt will be measured by the current monitor when it generates or consumes the energy in the battery. And finally, all the negatives are joined together on this one stud. If we jump back to the web interface on the controller, there are four new parameters for controlling the state of charge. The first is the total battery capacity in amp hours. For my test environment, I wasn't sure of the capacity, so I guessed at 10 amp hours. The two parameters below control when the battery is considered fully charged. The state of charge is automatically reset to 100% when the voltage exceeds this value and the charging current falls below this value for at least three minutes. You can also fine tune the charge efficiency to cater for losses in the cables and internal resistance of the cells. Lithium cells are very efficient, so I'm using a 99.9% .9 here. You could set this to 100% to, to disable this feature. When you power on the shunt for the first time, it assumes the battery is fully charged and defaults to 100%. This value will then get calibrated as the cell is charged and discharged in normal use. It's also possible that the state of charge will exceed 100%. This happens when the amp hour capacity isn't set correctly, or if the reset hasn't occurred for a long period of time. And power counting isn't an accurate science. However, the internal code in the shunt uses Coulomb counting, which should help to keep track of the energy coming in and out of the shunt. As I didn't know the, what amp power capacity my cells were, I used the MQTT login feature of the, of the controller to generate these graphs during the charge and discharge cycle. I started to charge the battery using a bench power supply. As the shunt had just been powered up, it was already at 100% state of charge. So you can see the state of charge increase up to 105%. This is a hard-coded limit of the shunt and it indicates that you need to calibrate the amp hour capacity or simply run a full charge and discharge cycle. As the voltage on the cells increases and the current drops, the shunt automatically resets to 100% fully charged state. This also resets the amp hour counters. As the charge continues, you can see that these small ramps and resets every three minutes as the shunt continues to register, the battery is fully charged. This, this generally means I need to tweak these parameters a little bit better. Finally, I stop charging and begin to discharge the battery using a couple of LED light bulbs. These are only a 10 watt load, so it'll take several hours to discharge. I started this test at 7pm and it ran until 6am the next day. I set up a rule in the controller to disconnect the load if the battery voltage drops below 10 volts or if a single cell goes below 3.1 volt. From the graph, you can see the peak milliamps consumed was 9,500. So my original guess of 10 amp hours was almost perfect. Looking at the individual cell voltages on the graph, 
you can see that cell one has an issue compared with the other two cells. The discharge was stopped because the low cell rule triggered. One of the cells went below 3.1 volts and you can see the cell recovering and then going low again. This cell must have an issue with capacity not being the same as the other cells or an issue with internal resistance. After the discharge test, I powered up the bench power supply again and recharged the battery to 12.6 volts. You can see that that uh, troublesome cell one almost immediately recovers its voltage and then goes into bypass quite quickly. The cells recharge following a normal constant current and then constant voltage curve. I started the charge with three amps of uh, current and then load it to one amp to avoid the cells going into bypass. As the cells recharge, the state of charge increases until you can then see it reset again at 100% when the voltage and current conditions are met. Okay, so now you've seen the improvements up to DIY BMS, you'll be wanting to get your hands on the code. As usual, this is available as a release on GitHub. You can download the release and upload it to the controller in the normal way. Follow the instructions on GitHub in the how to use the code section. If you want to use the new oversampling module code, you will also need to reprogram all the modules using the controller or the AVR do program. Don't forget to disconnect the module from the battery before re reprogramming. If you are also using the current shunt, you must also upgrade that at the same time. Otherwise, all the parameters on the controller will appear incorrect. Again, follow the instructions on GitHub. Before I leave you, I mentioned that I give a quick demo of using InfluxDB with DIY BMS. I'll be using something called a Docker container to run the application. It's a bit like a virtual machine. So on my Windows desktop, I've got uh, Docker installed. Uh, to do this, all you do is go to their website and download and run it. Now, from a command line prompt, we can get Influx running with only a couple of commands. The first one downloads all the images and files needed. The second configures the environment and starts it up. I'm using a few extra command line options here to automatically configure a username and password and to create a new bucket for my data. I'll put the command line in the video description, but it's really just a copy and paste from the Influx website. Over in DIY BMS, you need to tell it where, to, where the Influx server is and what bucket to use. Note that you have to use the full URL to the server, so include the API v2 write on the end and the port number, like in the example. Currently, DIY BMS doesn't support encrypted connections, so you can't connect to the, to the InfluxDB cloud using HTTPS. Looking at the Influx interface, you can explore the data, filter down to the cell level data, select the variable V, which is for the cell voltage, and there you go, instant graphs. I'm not an expert user, so I'll leave you to explore. Before we wrap up this video, I'd like to say thank you to all the Patreons who support this channel and, and the project as a whole. There are over 60 of you supporting me and your gener generosity is amazing. If you're stuck with this video till the end, well done. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and like this video. It only takes a second of your time, but really does help me with the YouTube ranking. As a reward to staying to the end, here's a sneak peek of what's coming in the next video. See you soon.